This happened to me around two years ago, but I still think about it from time to time and it still creeps me out. I was 20 years old at that time I was a college student and had just moved into a new apartment on the first floor of a building. It was late Saturday night and I was sitting in my room watching the movie. My roommate was out with his girlfriend for a Saturday night parties. Then suddenly somebody knocked on the door. This was not uncommon, as we were in college, and my roommate had friends that would come by to hang out at all hours of the day. I just figured it was one of his friends, so I get up and check the peephole. Staring right back at me through the peephole is an eyeball pressed against it. Again, this is also something that one of our friends might do just to be funny. I chuckled and opened the door, surprised to see a guy in his mid-twenties that I didn't recognize. He was strange, to say the least. He was very hyper and immediately launched into a door-to-door -door salesman type pitch. I can't remember exactly what he was even selling, but it was something about the local university, which I also attended at the time. The whole time he was talking, he kept looking past me into the apartment. He was fidgeting and even standing on his tiptoes to see inside. Still, I just thought the guy was weird and nervous, and might not have been all there. I politely declined to buy anything from him, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I finally had to be pretty stern in telling him that I wasn't interested. He finally accepted defeat, and as I was closing the door, he put his hand out and stopped the door from closing. Before I can be like, what the fuck, dude? He smiles at me and says, I like Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 too. Now me and my roommate had been staying up late into the night playing Mario Kart 64 in my bedroom for the past several days before that. But there was nothing that he could see from the apartment entrance that had anything to do with Mario Kart. I was taken aback and trying to add things up in my head and confusingly asked, how do you know I play Mario Kart? He then got super nervous and said, Oh, oh, I just thought that anyone with a couch like that would be into Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64, cause, you know, it's like a retro game, and that's a retro couch. Well, what the hell is this explanation, lol? I think in my mind... Then he was like, okay, bye, and literally scurried away. I shut the door and locked it. I start trying to put the pieces together on how he could have known that, because obviously... It wasn't because of my grandma's old couch. Remember, it's a first-floor apartment that backed up to Woods. My roommate got home shortly after that, and I immediately tell him about the encounter. He was freaked out too, and so we start investigating. At first, it seemed as if there was no way to even see inside my bedroom. My blinds were always down. We went outside and tested it and found that the only way to see inside would have been if you had your face right up against the window. And even then you kinda had to crouch and close one eye, just to get a glimpse of the inside. A couple more creepy details. My window was over a balcony, and the Nintendo 64 console itself was stored inside of the TV stand and was not visible. You'd only be able to see it while we were actively playing which we never did until we were a little stoned and it was like 2 a.m. So basically this fucking creep had been jumping the railing to our balcony, pressing his face against my window, and watching us play Mario Kart in the middle of the night. Never saw the guy again, but needless to say I was pretty paranoid for a while after that. I constantly checked my windows and woke up in the middle of night paranoid that he was standing just a couple feet away, watching me sleep. Just a very unsettling encounter. I'm glad that nothing more ever came of it, and that I never saw him again, but I have always wondered what his motives were. This incident happened to me last year when I moved to another city. After finishing my high schooling, I assessed several college options and decided on one that would have me move roughly three hours. I found a fine apartment where I would be able to live without any roommates and that was in a safe part of town with reasonable rent. It was close to some attractions in the city, which was an added bonus to me as it would still allow me to have a reasonable social life. For the first few months or so it was great. 
There were absolutely no problems or safety concerns of any sort, and I managed to become good friends with a guy who studied at the same college as me. He coincidentally lived around just 10 minutes away from me so we would often hang out at each other's place. One night just as winter started, he called me over to play video games and hang out. We had a pretty chill night, drank a few beers, had a good few laughs, and enjoyed ourselves. At around 1 a.m., we decided to call it a wrap, and I headed home to my apartment. When I got back home, I decided to head out to the balcony that overlooked the entrance of my building to smoke a cigarette. I vividly remember looking around and seeing absolutely nobody. It was a cold winter night, and it wasn't the weekend, so understandably everybody was at home. Besides the usual car or two passing by, it was dead quiet. Once I finished my cigarette, I decided to call it a night and got ready for bed. I was understandably confused when I heard a short ring on my doorbell. I stood in the center of my room for a solid few seconds as confusion and a little bit of fear set in. I snapped out of it and decided to tiptoe to my door and to just try and hear if anyone was outside. My immediate thought was that my friend came over to drop off something that I might have forgotten. But I thought to myself that he would have texted me or called. I probably listened for half a minute or so when the person once again ringed the doorbell and softly knocked a few times. I was stood still and didn't want to make a sound so that I wouldn't give away the fact that I was at the door. I heard the stranger pacing around the apartment for a few seconds before he stopped. I waited for any sort of noise, but it was quiet. That was when I decided to look at the peephole to see that he hopefully had left. I picked up the cover of the peephole and took a look. My legs pretty much went numb as I saw a hooded figure looking straight into the peephole. He was holding the zipper of his hoodie so as to cover his face. All I could really make out was his forehead and eyes. He must have either heard me lift the cover or my heavy breathing because right away he moved from the peephole and said, I know you're at the door. By this point I was pretty much shivering in fear but mustered up the courage to say, I'm calling the cops, man. He laughed and said, sure thing, big guy. He proceeded to wipe away the door handle with his sleeve before walking off. I understandably called the police. When they came over, they informed me that I wasn't the only one. He had been doing this for at least a month, and they suspected him of at least one home invasion, where a father chased him out the house. I crashed at my friend's house for around a week or so after this before going back into my apartment. It's been a year, and I've never heard of any news about him. He could have been arrested by now, but as far as I know, he hasn't been. I find it more likely that he simply moved to a different area. I am not sure if he had any violent intent or not, but either way, let's seriously not meet again. My friend Craig and I made plans to go hang out with our friend Jeremy and his new girlfriend. Neither of us had to work the next day, so we grabbed some beers and made our way to Jeremy's mom's apartment complex, where Jir was temporarily staying. When we got there, we went out into the woods behind the apartment complex to drink. This wasn't just a little patch of trees, but a good-sized patch of forest. For context, this was in New York State. It was a nice fall day, late afternoon and the sun was still out. We finished the beers and decided to go get more. So we go to the store and get some more beer, head back to the apartments and enter the woods. This was autumn, and the light outside was right at that stage where it starts to very quickly fade. We underestimated how dark it would be once we were in the woods and how fast the light was fading away. We planned on making a fire, but didn't really count on it being so dark when we got back. So we're walking into this sort of clearing area, from where we can choose to head off in a few different directions. We're having a good time, laughing, talking, but something not too far in the distance catches my eye. It's too dark to tell, but I swear I can see a very large figure. No, that's too big. It's probably a tree, or just your eyes fucking with you. So as Jeremy is gabbing in the background, I ask Craig as an aside if he can see something standing up ahead. And he's like, nah, where? Oh, wait, there. Oh, shit. We were still walking, 
and it was becoming clear I wasn't seeing things. There was a very large person standing in the forest up ahead, apparently facing us. So I try to get Jeremy's attention without cluing the big guy in that we've noticed him, just in case something sketchy is going on. Which I get the serious feeling there is. We tell Jeremy there's a person up ahead, but Jeremy is in a jovial, no-chill state and he exclaims, Holy shit, is that Bigfoot? We humor him and laugh, but it's clear to Craig and I that this is actually creepy and probably not a safe situation. And it's clear that Jeremy is not understanding that. It's hard to communicate the pacing of our approach onto the guy, but essentially we had gotten too close not to acknowledge him. Partially because it took us a moment to get Jeremy's attention, and partially because we weren't trying to just turn around and run like we were scared. There were four of us, and one of him after all. But this was a big guy. Not supernaturally big or anything, and not like he was jacked or anything like that. Just a naturally gigantic dude, very tall and heavy without being particularly fat. And he was just standing there, in the middle of the forest, in the dark, alone. So as we approach this guy and just sort of say, hello, Jeremy, the absolute fool that he was, gets way too close into this guy's personal space as he enthusiastically tells him about how scary he looks standing in the woods alone. We thought you were an alien or something, bro. I thought you were going to jump up and blee -oor. Jeremy mimes an extra set of teeth coming out of his mouth like a Xenmorph from the Alien V's Predator movies, all up in this guy's face. To be clear, Jeremy is not trying to be intimidating or a jerk in any way. He is trying to be friendly and joking around with this guy, but he is literally leaning into this dude and practically sticking his hands in his face with his impression of an alien. Did I mention Jeremy was kind of a moron? Jeremy was kind of a moron. Love you, Jeremy, you were kind of a moron. And Jeremy's poor girlfriend, who was a few years younger than us and very shy, was clearly terrified to which Jer was also oblivious. So Craig and I are both standing here kind of trying to brainstorm a way out of this situation. Jeremy is clearly too dense to get it if we say that we have to go. He'd be like, what? We just got here, aren't we having a fire? And we were trying to seem confident and in control of the situation. Big guy says, oh, you guys are drinking? I got some drinks too and he walks over to the tree line where he has a bag laying beside a tree. He reaches in the bag, and while he grabs a beer with one hand, he sort of sneakily pulls something else out with his other hand and places it into his hoodie pocket. I'm convinced it was a knife or a gun, probably a knife, in all honesty. He then reapproaches us and cracks open his beer. I glance around casually, and then I notice something else. Somebody else is out here. There's someone moving along the tree line to our left, a relatively good distance away, but somebody else is here, and they're circling around as if to come up behind us. Fuck. This. I need to leave now. So I go, well, I gotta work in the morning, and Craig's driving me home, so we gotta get out of here. Jeremy, in his infinite wisdom, responds, What? You said you didn't have to work tomorrow. I face palm so hard on the inside. No, Jeremy. You must have misheard me. I said I do have to work tomorrow. And Jeremy, proving there is no end to his wisdom, says, All right, guys. Well, it was nice hanging with you. Get home safe. He wasn't leaving the woods with us. Craig and I started walking away, and I told him about the other person circling to get behind us and that we needed to move. We start trying to brainstorm a way to get Jeremy and his girlfriend out of there and decide to call him and tell him that his mom was out in the parking lot looking for him. Jeremy is terrified of his mom, Craig explains to me. And this should work. Because we clearly couldn't just call him and tell him the situation was not safe without him blurting out, this guy isn't sketchy, I feel totally safe. Jeremy was very mad at us for lying about his mom. I think his girlfriend appreciated it, though. I'm not sure what was going on there that night. I've talked to several people about it over the years, and there are a few different ideas. Did they know we were coming back? Were they waiting for us? 
Or did we stumble into something we weren't meant to? Almost everyone I tell about this says, you guys just accidentally interrupted a drug deal. But something about that just doesn't seem right. Who does a drug deal in the middle of the woods at night? I don't know. Very possibly just a homeless dude with no ill intention, and another homeless dude with no ill intention. But it was a very creepy and scary situation, and I just thought, In 2023, I found myself back in my hometown, where my parents had recently moved to a new place. At 17, I had always felt a peculiar connection to the supernatural, often noticing things that others seemed oblivious to since childhood. The new neighborhood had a dark history, nestled adjacent to an old cemetery, with tales of past murders and eerie occurrences stemming from the disputed ownership of the land. It was a fact we hadn't been aware of before moving in. Initially, everything seemed normal. However, one fateful night after returning from a late movie around 1-2 a.m., I spotted an ominous sight, a shadowy figure hanging from a wire. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief, but the figure remained, seemingly fixated on me with an unsettling gaze. Encountering such an apparition was disconcerting, but I brushed it off, attributing it to fatigue or a trick of the light. Yet, this enigmatic presence continued to manifest, always at the same late hour, often lurking ominously on the roof. Despite my trepidation, I frequently ventured upstairs alone at night, unaware of the spectral observer above. Then came the nights filled with the inexplicable sound of footsteps racing across the roof in a relentless, unearthly cadence. It was an impossibility, especially considering the bitter winter cold and the absence of any known individuals who might engage in such behavior. My nights were haunted by these relentless noises, and eventually, my mother too became aware of the inexplicable phenomenon. Seeking answers, she confronted our maid, who revealed that this spectral marathon runner was a well-known entity among those who had dwelled on the top floor. Supposedly, it was a restless spirit doomed to perpetually traverse the rooftop, a phenomenon so disturbing that it had driven a previous family from the home. The revelation chilled me to the bone, yet despite the fear it instilled, the entity had never inflicted harm upon me or anyone else. However, the sense of unease escalated when, just last night, I received an unexpected knock on my window around midnight, a portent of further unsettling encounters to come. For now, though, the specter's presence remained an eerie yet strangely benign aspect of my nightly existence. So, it has not been long since this incident happened to me. Whenever I think about that day, I still cannot sleep properly. My name is Leon, and I am 29 years old and also unmarried too. When I was 22 years old, my mother and father died. The cause of my father's death was diabetes and the cause of my mother's death was heart attack. When my father and mother both passed away, I still don't have to face much problems. The only reason for it was I was the single child in my family, so I don't have to take care of any of my younger sister or brother. Apart from this, my father belonged to a very rich background, so I don't have to face much financial issue. And my father owns a lot of property. So one of his property is in a affluent neighborhood where I decided to live that's the biggest mistake of my life. So I decided to move on there in a few weeks and finally settled there. For my self-satisfaction, I decided to work in a nearby community college as an adjunct professor. I enjoyed the work, so even though I didn't need to work, I continued to do so. It's was been long since I am living there, but I don't talk much with neighbors. I had gotten home from work around dusk on this day. It was really my favorite day of the week because I didn't have any night classes to teach. The sun was almost all of the way down when I arrived home, but not quite. 
It was going to be trash day the following morning, so I went into the garage to get the cans ready to take out onto the street. When I brought the cans outside, I noticed someone walking on the other side of the street. I didn't know my neighbors well, as I mentioned it, so I didn't know who it was. However, while I was taking the garbage out, I began having this really weird feeling. I am sure everyone listening this has had it before. You feel like someone is looking at you, even though you have no reason to really think that they are. But the feeling was strong, and it caused me to look up. The guy who I had seen walking across the street was walking very slowly, and I noticed him looking over at me. However, as soon as I looked at him, he looked away really quickly and afterward, he began walking faster down the street. I really didn't think too much about it as that sort of thing happens all of the time. I finished placing the garbage and recycling cans in their places, and then I went back into the house. I remember fixing myself a drink. If you have ever been a community college teacher, you would know why. Sometimes, when you are grading papers, the only thing that doesn't keep you from fearing for the future of humanity is having a drink while you are grading. Oh, by the way, I taught English 101 and 102, so that might give you a bit of an idea of what I had to deal with. After about an hour of grading papers, I got up to go and prepare something for dinner. When I was coming back to my seat in the front room, I looked out the front window. There was a street lamp right across the street from my house. I noticed what seemed like a figure standing in the shadows that were just to the side of the direct light. I had to squint a little bit to try and see if someone was actually there, though. When I did, I could have sworn that I had seen some movement away from the light. I thought about the guy that I had seen earlier that had been looking at me. Now I got just mildly concerned, but I wasn't thinking that someone out there was targeting or even aware of me in any way. I immediately began thinking that maybe there was someone out there that was planning on breaking into one of my neighbor's houses, but it was merely a passing thought at first. Sometimes I could absolutely let my imagination run away with me. So I didn't really concern myself too much. I had some dinner and continued grading papers. I didn't see anything else strange the few times that I had gotten up, but I did keep looking out the window, checking to see if the figure I had seen was still out there. There was one time when I thought that I might have seen someone, but I wasn't completely sure or my mind just playing with me. By the time I ended up going to bed that night, I had all but forgotten about seeing the figure outside. My imagination often got the better of me, as I just mentioned, probably because I did a lot of creative writing. I woke up in the middle of the night, breathless and completely unaware of what was going on. All I knew was that I woke up in shock in bed and I couldn't breathe for some reason. But after my head cleared up a little bit, I realized that someone was in my room. He had his hands over my nose and mouth and was trying to smother me. I bucked and struggled, but you have to know that it is hard when you can't breathe. I went into full panic mode, but I am still conscious and I am totally aware what was going around me. When I opened my eyes, I see an old man in his mid-fifties and his eyes are properly red also, his body is smelling like shit. He was trying to kill me, I should just act like I was dead. And so I went limp and rolled my eyes and held my chest still, not breathing but not struggling anymore either. I pretended to be dead. He still held his hand over my face for a few more seconds, but after that, he removed them. I did my best not to breathe and to make him think I was dead. He stood up straight for a moment, looking at me. Then he turned and walked out the door without even checking my pulse. I was shocked, but I began to take little short breaths until I was sure he was away, and then I pulled in the freaking air. I was scared, but I got up. I was still hurting from the smothering, but I was determined to get the guy. I was too weak, however, and he got out of the house and got away before I could catch up to him. So instead of following him, I called 911. I can't think of why anyone would want to try and kill me. To this day, I don't know who he was or why he was trying to do it. Fortunately, I never had any other attempts on my life, but that also keeps me from having any idea why this happened.
When I was about 14 years old, my parents began letting me stay home by myself. At first, it was only times when they would go out to eat or something of that sort. It was nice to have a few hours in the house to myself, but when I proved to them that I was able to stay home alone without any problems, these times definitely increased over time. When I was 15 years old, I actually got to stay home by myself over a four-day weekend. My parents wanted to go on a holiday cruise. They didn't plan on going without me, I just had no interest in going, I wouldn't tell them this for years afterwards, but being on a huge ship like that out in the middle of the ocean was pretty damn scary to me. Plus, it would be nice to have the house to myself for a whole four days. Two days had been the longest at that point that I had ever been by myself. I had the best plans for the time I was home by myself. I was going to eat myself a ton of pizza, and I was going to play myself a ton of video games. And that was about it. It was going to end up being the perfect weekend. They left on Friday morning, and I did have school on that day. I got out of school, and although normally my mom would pick me up and drive me home, I had no problem walking home that day. There weren't many kids from the school who walked, so I was pretty much by myself on the way home. It was about a 30-minute walk through town and then through my neighborhood to get home. My mom was a homemaker, so this was one of the few times when I got home that I found the house completely empty. It was a really weird experience and I have to admit to feeling a little strange at first. My dad was a doctor and we lived in a really nice and big house and being alone in such a place was always a different experience. That night, I did exactly what I had planned on doing. I ordered pizza, got myself some soda, and don't tell my parents, but I nicked some drinks out of the liquor cabinet, and I just settled in and played video games until I fell asleep in my room. I didn't turn on any of the lights in the house either. Whenever I had to walk around to get something to drink or otherwise, I just walked around in the dark. I could see where I was going because of outside lights shining in the downstairs windows. Plus, I was playing horror games, and those are best to play when you keep the house nice and dark. I was wearing my headphones as I was playing the games too. If you play horror video games, you know they are a lot more fun with headphones. You can hear the sounds that might be warning you of an upcoming terror approaching you from behind or about a corner. It just made the whole situation a lot scarier than it had to be. But that's why we enjoy it. I kept my headset on as I was walking throughout the house, since they were wireless. A few times I went and grabbed myself another drink. I didn't worry about my parents finding out about that, since they drank enough that I doubt they ever paid attention to how much was missing from their cabinet. I wasn't used to drinking, and I didn't want to get myself really drunk, so I only nipped a little bit each time that I came out. I got up to go and get myself another drink. As I was walking back toward the steps, I had the strangest feeling. I don't know how to describe it really, but it was a feeling that I wasn't alone. I hadn't gotten such a feeling before and I really didn't care for it. Going up the stairs, I was pretty nervous, but I really didn't know why other than the strange feeling. I didn't see anything, so I decided that it was nothing but an odd feeling. It must have come out of nowhere. When I got to the top of the stairs, I don't know why I did it, but I turned to look down the stairs. When I did, I found myself looking at a really big man standing right there. Someone had broken into the house, which they may have thought was deserted because I had the lights off all the time. But he saw me looking at him, and that's when things got scary. The man started up the stairs after me. I ran as fast as I could, trying to get into my bedroom. I was able to get in there and get the door closed. I locked it and immediately heard him pounding on the door. I ran to my cell phone. The door was not going to hold for very long. In fact, if the guy had any sense, he could have unlocked it from the outside. But it didn't matter, and I called 911. The response was immediate. There must have been a police car close by because I heard the sirens really quickly. And I guess the guy heard them too because he stopped pounding on the door. I heard him also running away from the door. I didn't know what to do, but I went to look out the window. My window faced the backyard and that is the way the intruder tried to get out. 
I watch it as he jump at the fence. The cops caught up to the guy pretty quickly and arrested him. They brought him by the house so I could identify him as the man that I saw. Even though it had been dark, I knew that it was him. The guy went to jail. I was happy about that. What I wasn't happy about were the memories of what happened. I mean, I was walking around the house with my headphones on, and the man was in the house while I was doing this. I wondered how much was going on in the house that I hadn't noticed. I wondered how long he had been in there with me, totally unaware, and how long I had been in danger. Some encounters are not as serious, but creepy nonetheless. A few years ago, when I was living in Los Angeles, California, I lived next door to a mortuary. Tons of creepy energy from here alone. And right behind my house was a halfway house, full of ex-cons, drug addicts, alcoholics, etc. The house was two stories and overlooked my backyard. They would play loud rock music early in the mornings, and some of them would sit in the window upstairs to smoke. There was one guy in particular who smoked a lot. Almost every other hour I would see him taking drag after drag from his cigarette, watching my backyard intently. He looked sort of young, maybe early thirties. He had greasy black hair that I guess he attempted to cut and tidy up somewhat, and scabs marks all over his colorless face. He wore black thick-rimmed glasses. He had a deranged, psychotic sort of energy, but he wasn't aggressive, hard to describe. I'm not one to judge anyone in his position, but the way he would always watch my house and anyone that would come outside to the backyard. It was disturbing to say the least. After a while, I would stop coming out back. He would always be up there. Wild, unblinking eyes, watching me as I walked around. He never spoke or made a sound. He just watched. One day, I watching movies with my family in the living room. The living room of that house led into the backyard. There was a window behind one of our couches that faced directly outside. We had the blinds and the window open. It was a warm night, sometime in the summer. I was sitting on the couch with the window directly behind me. I think I heard something outside, I'm not sure, but for some reason I turned around to look out of the window. And there he was, up in his window, looking right at me. He was shirtless. I could see scabs all over his upper torso. His eyes were wider than normal. They had a sick, perverted look to them. There was no cigarette or smoke I could see. His hands were down, out of view. I think B was even nodding his head a little bit. We stared at each other for a short few seconds before I abruptly closed the blinds and silently continued to watch the movie. I don't think my family noticed. I had trouble sleeping that night, knowing he was still over there, lol. Luckily, I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. This happened when I was 26 F. I'm now in my 30s. At the time I was preparing applications for grad school so after work each evening I would go to the local university library and stay until closing, which was 12 p.m. I took the subway to my neighborhood and decided to make a quick stop at the nearby 24-hour grocery store to get some things for a late-night dinner. I bought my items and was back outside waiting at the crosswalk for the light to change so I could cross the street. There were at least three other people waiting at the crosswalk as well. I lived in a major metropolis, and so there were almost always other people around at whatever time of night or day. Suddenly. A man comes running from out of nowhere, it seemed, and stands next to me, now also waiting at the crosswalk. He was middle-aged, about 5'9", and had a slim build. I thought that maybe he just wanted to make sure he would make the light and not miss the chance to cross. However, as we are crossing the street, I notice that he starts to make some odd movements with his legs. I don't really know how to describe it other than to say he was kind of tripping himself up and drastically slowing down so that he went from walking in front of me to suddenly being directly behind me. To be honest, my first thought at the time was racism. 
I have a very petite and feminine build, looked very young, and was clutching library books in my arms, but I am also a black woman. I truly thought that he was scared to have me walk behind him. It never even entered my mind that I might be the one in danger. I simply noted his behavior, laughed it off, and then forgot about him. On my walk home, I passed a small convenience store that I frequented for inexpensive fresh produce that was also opened 24 hours. I decided to make a quick stop and get a few more items for dinner. I was in the store for maybe five minutes and had truly forgotten about that man from the crosswalk. Except, when I exited the store, he was standing outside. I was so startled, it looked like he had been waiting for me. My heart started to pound in my chest and I was going into survival mode. As soon as I passed him and continued walking home, he also started walking, following right behind me. I could hear his steps and sense him nearby. I needed to make sure that he was really following me so that I could plan my next move. I could see the entrance to the subway just ahead of me. I decided I would duck into the subway station to see if he followed me in, but more importantly, to ask for help from the ticket collector. Unfortunately, when I went into the station, the ticket collector was not in the booth. The station was completely empty, no commuters either. I spontaneously decided to hide against a wall to the left, where I could not be seen from the street entrance. Thirty seconds later, the man walked into the station so nonchalantly he was almost skipping, as he headed right to the turnstile as if it was his plan all along to take the train. However, at the last minute, he looked behind him and saw me standing there against the wall. As soon as he saw me, he stopped, turned completely around and walked out of the station, no longer intending to go down into the subway. I knew I was undeniably in danger. I took out my phone and called my roommate, let's call him Tim, praying he was home and would pick up. He did. I explained in a panic what was happening. Are you home? Can you come get me? I asked. Tim asked me if the man was still there. I carefully peeked around the wall to look out to the street. There was the man. He was standing, smoking, and laughing with some guys. He was literally making friends as he waited for me outside the station. I told Tim, yes, the man is still there. A train must have arrived downstairs in the subway because at that moment there was suddenly a bunch of people coming through the turnstile and exiting the station. Tim and I agreed that I should leave the station in this crowd of people, stay on the phone with him and he would meet me on the street and essentially we would walk towards each other. Our house was only a five minute walk away on the same street as the station. When I left the station, I had to pass the man. He saw me in the crowd. I saw him throw down his cigarette and then from behind me I heard him say to the men he had been talking to, I have to go. He continued to follow me. I told Tim everything since we remained on the phone. I tried to walk as quickly as I could, but there was snow and ice on the sidewalk. I don't know why I didn't alert any of the other people who had exited the subway station and were now walking with me on street. It was sort of this experience of feeling alone in a crowd, if you know what I mean. I knew the man was behind me, but was too scared to look back more than once to check. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw Tim walking towards me on the sidewalk. We were both very young, but Tim, 20 male, is tall, over 6 ift, maybe 186, 187 centimeters. I felt a wave of relief as he came to my side. He told me he took a knife from the kitchen to defend us, in case. Our house was right ahead. We walked quickly inside and locked the door. With the lights off, we looked out the window for the man, but he was nowhere in sight. This happened a couple of years ago to me and my two other friends, 23 female, we were probably 19 at the time. It was summer evening and we had plans to go to our friend's house. There is this park that is halfway from mine and hers, so my friends and I decided it could be nice to sit in this hut in the park and have a smoke on the way to our friends. This was in the evening so it was getting dark already and time passed. It was dark enough for the streetlights to turn on. 
It's important for the story to explain a bit how the hut was situated in the park. The park was shaped like a big circle around a lake. So the hut we sat at had two entrances from the left and right side. These entrances then connected to the main park path. The hut is open and just has bench seats in a circle and a roof but open air, if that makes sense. Anyways, the street lights on the right side were not working, so it was extremely dark on that side. My friends and I are chatting away and people are walking past like normal nothing strange. Then this man comes from the left and is walking really slowly now. Normally this wouldn't catch my attention, but it's the summer, remember and he had on a long, thick trench coat with a top hat that had a feather and sunglasses. He walked super slowly into the dark and just stood there in the dark. I could make out his silhouette, just standing there. At this point, all of my friends are quiet as well, and we are feeling uneasy, as we are all girls. Then the man begins to walk back towards the street light that has light on the left side. He stands there for a couple seconds, staring again. Then he proceeded to walk slowly down the path to the hut still staring at us. We thought maybe he would just walk through and wanted to scare us, but no. He then sits down in front of us and begins to talk. For context, we live in Brussels, so he started speaking French and said, what a lovely evening, ladies. We can speak and understand French, but in that moment we knew it was smarter to pretend we don't, so we just say, sorry, English. You can see him get agitated and mad. He starts going on this whole rant about how we should speak the language of the country. Stupid English people think they are better than everyone else. As I said he was quite mad while saying all this. I began saying to my friends we should probably leave now our friend is expecting us at her house soon. Since my other friends were so scared too the minute I said that they said yes and started to walk the path to the main park path but they left their bags and everything. I had to call them back like guys, our bags, and they came running back, and while we are quickly gathering our things, he's just staring at us. We got our things, and started walking, when suddenly we hear, hey, hey, come back here. We turn around to see him holding up the can of coke my friend had left, and he said we should not litter and to come back and throw it away. We began to run at this moment, and didn't look back. The whole way to my friend's house, we were so creeped out and scared that we thought he would follow us or something and any person who walked behind us we panicked. What scared us the most was he had his hands in his pocket the entire time and then moment he held up the coke can. There was something else in his hand that shined with the street light. None of us could make it out but we assumed with the shape of the object, the way it shined from the light his behavior and his hand in his pocket the whole time, as well as calling for us to come back, we think he had a knife. We have never seen that man since, and all of us refuse to go around that area at night now. Really scared us. My sister, 25 female, and I, 27 female, live across town from our parents close to the highway. Our mom and dad had cooked a big meal and invited us over for food. We began our drive down the strip, where all of our food places and gas stations are lined on both sides of the road, and came to a light. We were sitting when we noticed a guy staring at us. We dismissed it. People look into others' cars all the time, no big deal. The light changed and everyone began moving. We somehow ended up behind the guy and he was driving obnoxiously slow and wasn't moving to let anyone pass him. I finally got an opening and sped up to get in front of him. Since, at this particular time, traffic had gotten heavy, we decided to get off the highway to head through town. The same guy turned off too. I didn't think anything of it because a lot of people cut through town to get out of highway traffic. We continued on our way and I noticed the guy went from his slow pace to riding on our asses like he could have been in our trunk. I sped up just a little because I despise people tailgating me. He sped up too. I sped up some more and began turn off on side roads where there were houses because I had a feeling he was now following us. 
or he was just driving like a maniac. It was both. I guess I had pissed the dude off when I overtook him on the highway. He began throwing his hands up, honking, and getting real close and backing off. Every turn I made, he was on us. I had gotten real anxious, at this point, and was almost flying through stop signs. I didn't want panic too much because I didn't want my sister freaking out. I had to think quick though. I changed my course so I was now heading to where the courthouse and police station was located. I realized that the guy didn't know where we were headed, which I was hoping. I was also prepared to drive straight to our parents' house and have our dad, 6'7", 250 plus LBS, waiting in the driveway when we pulled up. We got close enough to where you could start to see the police cruisers lined up in front of the station. Thankfully, the dumbass caught on, slowed way down, and turned off. I'm thankful that I didn't let panic overtake me to where I couldn't think clear to protect my sister and myself. No telling what that nutcase would have done. This thing happened to me almost a few years ago. It was the summer when Nintendo Switch had just hit the market, and for me, a 10-year-old gaming enthusiast, it was the ultimate dream. I relentlessly pestered my mom, hoping she'd cave in and get me the coveted console. My brother, a few years older, shared in my excitement, albeit to a lesser extent. One sunny afternoon, my brother and I were playing outside when we encountered a friendly stranger, a young man who introduced himself as a college student. He struck up a conversation with us, seemingly harmless at first. However, looking back, his demeanor was a bit too eager, his questions probing. Unbeknownst to us, our mom had noticed the interaction from afar and grew concerned. She intervened, joining our conversation to assess the situation. The stranger began talking about a charity donation, but amidst his spiel, he made an unsettling reference to GameStop something that caught my mom's attention like a red flag in a breeze. In a swift motion, she ushered us inside, concocting an excuse about needing to retrieve something. Once indoors, she wasted no time contacting the authorities, her voice laced with urgency as she relayed the encounter to the police dispatcher. Meanwhile, my brother and I were left in a state of confusion watching as our mom and grandmother engaged in hushed discussions and urgent phone calls. It wasn't until later, as the gravity of the situation sank in, that I realized the true danger we narrowly escaped. The thought that a stranger had been eavesdropping on our innocent conversation, possibly stalking us with ill intentions, sent shivers down my spine. Reflecting on the incident, it became clear that his charity pitch was likely a facade a ruse to gain our trust and extract information. As I grew older, the memory of that encounter served as a sobering reminder of the importance of caution around strangers and safeguarding personal information. It was a lesson learned through a chilling experience, one that underscored the need to remain vigilant in an unpredictable world. Before starting the main story, I will let you know, guys, that this was the most terrifying experience of my entire life. My name is Alan, and I am 32 years old male. This incident was just takes place just around two to three months before. After the funeral of my parents, I decided to live on a rural property by myself, as I am unmarried and like to live alone. So not exactly the most populated type of place. I've got neighbors, but they are about one miles away. Bit the story starts on Tuesday. It was late night, I think around 2, 3 p.m. Well, it was my bad habit to not sleep late at night because of movies. I was getting ready to eat dinner and when I heard a creak at the front gate. No big deal, it's a rural property. There is animals and all kinds of stuff here. You know, it's Australia, guys. These noises went on for all about 15 seconds. But then, I heard something out of the ordinary the gate shut again. Animals could not open it by themselves. 
Someone was on the premises. I didn't have a gun because my country had gun laws, so I just got up and walked out the front door. There was no one there. I was bit scared, and without hesitation, I went back inside and called 911 and I told them what happened. I told them my address and they said it would be about a 10 minute drive and said I should lock myself in my bedroom. I went in there and locked the door and I waited for about a minute. Then I heard a noise I'll never forget. The front door started to jiggle, it eventually stopped, but then I remembered something that scared me to death. The side door doesn't lock. I dove under the bed not even thinking. The side door freaked open and heavy boots stomped inside. It wasn't police, I could tell. I listened for a minute, and then they went into 12 spare bedroom, right next to mine. I scrambled around and found a screwdriver, and I got out from the bed. I waited until I heard more footsteps, then I slammed open the door. There was no one there. I then felt a sharp pain in my leg and turned around to see a guy in a smiling bloody mask standing behind me, wiping blood off of his knife. I pushed him away and swung the screwdriver, cutting his hand open. He yelled and fumbled around trying to pick up the knife. I used the opportunity to run my ass out the open side door and made my way down the driveway. I ran for about 30 seconds, but when I looked back, he was running off the porch and towards me. I started sprinting, but my driveway was about a half mile long. I wasn't even halfway there. I kept running and turned around to see him so close he could dive and tackle me, but I stopped in my tracks and got on my knees. He fell over me and I got on top of him and punched him. I couldn't even tell you how many times the adrenaline rush got the best of me. I must have punched him over 20 times in the face. When he was unconscious I got up and hauled ass down the driveway. Police came screeching up and I told them what happened. Later at the station they said they found no one there. All that was there was the blood stain from his hand. After this incident, it is almost one month since I moved in city, and after that, I never seen that guy again. The world is full of creeps. Well, why I am saying this? You guys will get the answer till the end of story. Leaving my friend's house, I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox so my car was okay, but completely demolished the mailbox. No big deal, right? That's why we have insurance, right? I went to the neighbor and told them what happened and gave them my insurance, phone number and name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He kept hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I left. On my drive to my mom's, I'm attending out-of-state college and parents are divorced. The guy I backed into, Robert, began to text me and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us to just pay out of pocket for the mailbox, sending me links to companies that could fix it for $500 and demanding I go on a date with him so I could give him the cash for the repair and he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with the food was. I declined everything, but started to get annoyed by his constant texts and calls. Finally, after two days of it with my responses only, please contact my insurance. I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him, but he made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school, okay? This wasn't a hit and run. I blocked the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or video of the accident to his insurance. I admit, this made me angry. I called this number and dug my nails so hard into my thigh I drew blood as he threatened reporting things, asking me on a date and trying to entice me to just pay cash. I finally screamed, don't contact me again you fucked or inbred piece of C. My dad heard me and was upset. I said that to someone I was in an accident with and that I said that to a guy who thought I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. Next day, he reaches out again to tell me I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it'd be easier to pay cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess and began trying to validate my info. 
he had my mom's name, address, and phone number. I verified it, told him to not contact me again, and blocked his new number. Next morning super early I get a text, basically saying he finished the claim and I was awful for making it harder. Then it needed to be by going through insurance and not going on a date with him. He then included, You're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks, stay on the good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. Fifth number blocked. Then at midnight he texts, You up, I know where you live. Don't try and screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You should have just gone on a date with me. I took the phone to my dad, showed him the texts, and filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then calls the guy. He answered, Shoot, I knew you were into me. Wanna come over? My dad got very mad. My dad said this was beyond harassment. This was his final warning to not contact me. That we didn't care how he reported it, etc. Robert began saying I came on to him and offered sex as payment, invited him to my house, and was a horny buck and instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. Next day, talk to insurance, protective order filed, get another text, telling me I shouldn't have involved police, block seventh number, notify police, go to stay at my dad's because dude doesn't have this address. My dad is a very tall, very scary dude who loves his second amendment. Late last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother doorbell rings. Dad goes to see who it is, and it's fucking Robert with a trash bag filled with things I left at his house. I call the police. My dad goes ballistic. All the things. Police come. Arrest guy. The bag. Lingerie. A knife. Lip balm and a Dita Von Tess fetish book. Just met with an attorney. Well, here is twist. We will get to know that Guy doesn't own the house, is an illegal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful he's being deported. I genuinely think he wanted to rape and or kill me. I go back to school in a few days, and am so terrified he or someone else will follow me. I, F31, used to work at a restaurant in my early 20s as a hostess. Back then, I was a people pleaser and didn't have the backbone I have now. During my shift, there was a man in the bar area, which can be seen from my stand, who eventually approached me. He was in his 50s, probably 6'3", muscular large build, dark hair, and he dressed well. When he approached, it started out as small talk. I can't remember the beginning of the conversation but then he started asking me if I had considered a different job and said I should come work for him but wouldn't tell me what he does. He started asking me for my phone number. I didn't feel comfortable giving this stranger my personal information, so I told him he could call the restaurant and ask for me. I'm there a lot. He didn't like that answer. He continued asking and I gave him the same answer. Finally, I told him I'd give him my email. I gave him a fake email address on a piece of paper, obviously. I made it look real, but I wasn't interested in continuing the conversation because he was being very pushy, so I excused myself to the back. I remained friendly and smiled during the entire exchange, because that was my job. After avoiding him for a while, I saw him going back and forth from the bathroom, eyes darting around the restaurant, head turning around every which way. He was clearly looking for me, and I was actively avoiding him. I started to get scared thinking maybe he was trying to kidnap or traffic me or something, which didn't feel like a stretch because of the way our exchange went. I decided to tell my manager he was making me uncomfortable and told them what happened. However, I forgot to mention I gave him a fake email address. My manager approached him and asked him to leave because he was making staff uncomfortable. This man argued with my manager in front of the entire restaurant. He was saying he just wanted to have a conversation, and that was it. He was refusing to leave. I was standing there during the entire argument, and he pulls out the email address and says, If I'm making her uncomfortable, why did she give me her email address? And shoved it into our faces. Instead of explaining to him and my manager that it was fake, I froze. I was angry and in complete disbelief of the situation. 
He eventually left. My manager hated me after that. I left not long after, and to this day, that manager still doesn't know the email was fake. I don't know why I never told her. I don't know why I froze. I don't know what that man wanted. I've thought about it a lot since then, and it was almost a decade ago. I'm glad I didn't give him anything he wanted, but I wish I could tell my younger self to stick to her guns and don't take shit from anyone, especially a man who is using intimidation tactics to try and get what he wants, whatever that was. If you guys watching till here, then make sure to give your feedback in comment section. I wish you a good day. Thanks for watching.